Last week, we uh, started looking at the subject of heaven on earth and uh, attempted to answer the question, you know, why do we even need to talk about this stuff? Because I know a lot of you are wondering that, you know, what is the deal? I, I don't like talking about the end times. That stuff scares me. So let me preface what I'm about to say with this. This is really good news. I mean, the, with what Jesus is about to do as far as his church is concerned is incredible. The Bible says the end time church will be without spot or wrinkle, will be operating in power beyond anything the world has seen. The greatest revival of all time is coming. So we're not going to get swept away by Jesus' judgment against the wicked any more than the Israelites were swept away by the, God's judgment on Egypt. So God's protection is going to be over his people. In fact, part of John's prophecy in the book of Revelation was sealed for that group. So there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going to come online, uh, and I think it's inside information about what we're to do and, and how we're going to work in cooperation with Jesus, like Moses worked in cooperation with God and brought the plagues on Pharaoh and, and the people of Egypt. So I, I think God is... Already, we're, we're seeing this global prayer movement that, that's being raised up. That's why I'm resonating with this. I, I really believe this is a God thing that we're beginning to see. Now, whether, you know, I get to live to see all this happen, I, again, I don't know. I just know the nation of Israel becoming, uh, coming back to their homeland was a huge, huge wake-up call. So God is awakening his church. There's no question about that. Another reason we got to talk about this is uh, God warns the shepherds of Israel in numerous places that if you withhold this information about what's coming and what's about to happen from the people of God, their blood will be on your hands. So <laughs> I am not going to be responsible for anybody in this church being clueless about what's, you know, what's coming and where we're, we're headed because things, they are a change in right now in and, uh, and both good and horribly bad ways. And if you missed last weekend, uh, that's now on YouTube or you can get the CDs in the bookstore. The best way to do this, just subscribe to our Grace YouTube channel. Then you get all of our stuff. It's all out there. It's all neatly archived, everything. Or you can go to our webpage, you can get to it from there, you can get to it from uh, our Facebook page as well. All right, so we said the first reason we, we study this subject is that it fulfills our God-given need for fascination. God, God's plan to end evil and restore peace to the planet is beyond brilliant. I mean, it, it, there's no human mind that could conceive what he's about to do. For decades, I've been watching the news, you know, wondering how in the world... Can any leader ever fix the mess we've got going in the Middle East? It gets worse every year, every, every day now it gets more complicated. And I think here in the 21st century, God is letting us see the ultimate end of man's wisdom in every arena of life. When, when he takes his hands off and he lets us go our own way, I mean, we disintegrate into chaos quickly, and it's happening everywhere right now. But what we know from Scripture is that one day Jesus is coming back to fix it all. And before this is over, the church will be crying out for that with one voice as never before. Come, Lord Jesus. That's never happened. As I've been digging into this, I'm discovering you just layer on layer. The Scripture just, you know, prophetically gives us uh, so much insight into this. 150 chapters are specifically devoted to the end times. All the Old Testament prophets refer to it. In the New Testament, Jesus, Paul, Peter, John, fill in more details. And as you add layer on layer, the, the, the picture just comes into focus. Last week we talked about the universal appeal of science fiction and fantasy stories right now. How anytime a new Star Wars or Star Trek movie gets released. Fans show up dressed like Darth Vader or, you know, Dr. Spock. Got Trekkie conventions and Star Wars theme weddings. We love to immerse ourselves in the mystery and conflict of other worlds. God put that in us. There's that inner drive. You know, we love being wowed by completely other than us places and creatures and things. And stunning the end time taps that. 
talking about angels and demons and the spirit world. I mean, it, it, it ex, uh, the, the Bible exposes what lies beyond the visible realm, describing things like the horrors of Armageddon to the beauty of the heavenly city of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. It talks about how Jesus will pull off what no man has ever been able to do. He will single-handedly end all war, and the way he goes about it is breathtaking. And I'm not trying to say, you know, that the Bible reveals the, the future simply to satisfy our curiosity or to make us keepers of secret knowledge, but it does engage that part of who we are, and he wants that. He wants us to be fascinated by what's coming. He also reveals the future for extremely practical purposes, and one is to help us get ready for it. It's the principle of preparation. We want to be filled with hope so we stay motivated to help people, to, to, to love people, to help them get ready. When John talked about the resurrection, he said, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. When we become convinced of this reality, it changes the way we live. We, we don't live like we are right now, just totally immersed in the here and now. We live with an understanding that we were made for another age, that, we are, that, that this is all focused. This whole life is focused on that age. The disciples asked Jesus what would be the signs of his coming, the end of the age. First thing he says in Matthew 24, 4 is watch out that no one deceives you. Stay awake, be on the alert, pay attention. Look at what's happening in the culture. Watch for any major changes. Know where this stuff is headed. And then he runs through a list of calamities that will intensify as the end approaches. He said, talks about wars and famines and plagues and earthquakes and the persecution of believers. He says in verse 10, many will be offended. That's the New King James Version. Other translations say many will turn away from me. They'll betray and hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now, the word I want to go back to is offended. It's the Greek word, scandalizo. <laughs> Sounds like the name of a popular TV show, doesn't it? It means to put a snare in the way of, somebody, in the way of someone and cause them to stumble or to give offense. What he's talking about here are Christians who are going to be scandalized by the way Jesus judges wickedness. And that's what we don't want to do. When things start to go down, we Americans don't handle it well. I mean, we, we're not good at hardship of any kind. And I'm talking about even the easy stuff, an economic storm or a power shortage. When Stuart was here, he was telling me, you know, being from Suriname, he said, you know, we've gone through stuff. But he said, boy, I don't know that I want to do this with Americans. He said... You people don't do this well. You know, you don't handle hardship very well. I mean, they've been without power in Mozambique for months. And, I mean, these people just go on with life. For us, it was like, this is horrible. You know, there's no cold. The, the water, the shower water is cold. You know, church going, law abiding, Bible reading, praying believers are going to be deeply offended. Saying, why is this happening? Why aren't things getting better? Why am I hurting? Where are you, Lord? This is bogus. I've been inconvenienced. You know, I shouldn't be, it shouldn't be this way. You know, the real danger on a lot of these popular TV shows right now, the, all the kind of Armageddon, apocalyptic kind of stuff, it's not the zombies. It's the people <laughs> you have to worry about. You know, when our lifestyle gets messed with, people get nasty. Man, believers get mad at God. Look at verse 13 again. He who endures, and he's not talking about a day for a week or a year. He's talking about till the end. Jesus says, that's the person who shall be saved. The biggest temptation at the end of the age. Not the end of the world, because that's the other fallacy. People say, I don't want to hear about the end of the world. The world's not ending. Jesus is coming to fix the world. The world is going to go on. What we're talking about is the end of this era where God is letting man do his own thing. And the, the biggest temptation at the end of this age 
when, when God's taking his hands off the culture and people are being able to express themselves, is going gonna, is gonna to be people wanting to chuck their faith. That's the devil's main target. That's what he was after with Peter. After he denied Jesus, Jesus had prayed that Peter's faith wouldn't fail. And it's what he taught us to pray for ourselves and each other, that God would lead us not into big-time temptation, because that's, that's what he's talking about, the perfect storm temptation, where we just want to give up, chuck it all, you know, give in. The biggest issue for Christians in the days ahead will be trusting Jesus' leadership when we don't understand what's going on, when it doesn't seem to be making sense, when we don't know what's around the corner. And his most repeated warning is don't be deceived. And Jesus tells us to do two things to keep that from happening. They're one word each. Know what, remember what that is? Watch and pray. There you go. Watch and pray. Two things that uh, are dynamically connected to us enduring. Later that night in the Garden of uh, Gethsemane, rather, he, just before he's arrested, and he knows full well they're going to run for the hills. They're going to desert him. Matthew 26, 41, he told him, he said, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. I know, so the big one, that's what he's talking about. He said, I know your spirit's willing, but your flesh is weak. In other words, you're going to want to curl up and go to sleep. I know you guys, but shake yourself. Cry out to God for help because he will generously give you strength to get up, get through whatever's coming. He's going to, he's not backing away from you. He's, he's with you in this. In Matthew 24, 37, Jesus had told them specifically what to watch for. He says, as, as the days of Noah were, so also will, be, uh, will the coming of the Son of Man be. Luke 17, 27 adds a few more details. He says, they ate, they drank, they married until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. This is, again, the, that story of Sodom and Gomorrah where God, you know, judged the, the, the nation, the, the city, rather. It says they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, Sodom suddenly it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Genesis 6, 5 says of Noah's day, the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart were, was only evil continually. The earth was filled with violence. That's where we're headed. And lots of Lot's day, Ezekiel 16, 49 says, this was the sin of Sodom. They were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They had the ability to, but they, they did not help the poor and the needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Now, it's pretty easy to see that's the trajectory, you know, society is, is on right now, especially in this country. These people were surrounded by violence and immorality. The world's falling apart around them, and they were just going about business as usual. All the while, Noah prepared for judgment, devoting all his time and energy to getting ready, praying, faithfully get, obeying God and trusting, uh, trusting in God and preaching righteousness. Second Peter 2, 5 says, in trying to convince others to get ready, day after day he endured till the storm finally hit. Noah is, is kind of the Bible picture of what endurance looks like. We, we want to be warned. We want to be ready for what's coming. So we're motivated to keep our hearts close to the flame of his presence because our ability to endure these coming storms is going to be directly tied to our time with God, our connection with God, and with other believers, our time being connected to other Christians. I mean, how are you going to stand against the pressure to compromise if you're not in community with a small group of friends who are on the same wavelength? How are you going to be able to sustain a marriage when it's not even legal to get married? Paul tells us that's coming. I mean, that never even seemed possible till now. And now, yeah, they're already suggesting it. That's the way that we're going to resolve all this, you know, marriage issue. Parents, how are you going to be able to raise your kids without the moral support and wisdom and prayers of other believers? Jesus taught us 
to do Christianity in community. And that means hanging out with a small group of people who are committed to following Jesus with you. We want to stay focused on being strong spiritually so we can strengthen each other. You know, we've been talking about this in in staff meetings. I've been talking about this with everybody I'm with. You know, God is giving us insight right now. The the truth. Some of you, you know, have been coming up to me and go, whoa, man, do you know what you're saying? And I'm thinking, yeah, I know what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit's giving us light right now. That's why on the weekends, you know, there's this, whoa, we're seeing stuff. Let me tell you something. You won't keep seeing this stuff if you're not sharing it. You with me on this? I mean, if you are not talking this with somebody else, if you're not discussing this, if you're not teaching this to somebody, it's not going to stay alive in your heart. I, I know what's going to happen. We're all going to go right back to sleep. It's like, what was that stuff? You know, we were feeling and hearing, you know, a few years back. It's going to go away. It's, we're going to go back to sleep if we don't push into this, if we don't press into it. Now, I'll tell you how you do that. You get with a group of people, and, and, and it may be two people. It may be one person, and you say, let's study this together. Let's talk about this together. That's why we give you discussion questions. This is not just a cute little thing we do. It's this does not stay alive in our hearts if we're not fanning the flames. So, you know, fire pit, my fire pit, you don't fan that flame and put new logs on it, it's going to go out. And we need each other. That's how, we, that's how we keep the flames alive. The biggest challenge we face right now is staying awake. There is so much trivial stuff vying for our attention. Never in the history of mankind have we had so much distraction as we do right now. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, 3, uh, 13, 5, he says, examine yourself to see if your faith is even genuine. Test yourselves. See if you're awake. Pinch, your, you know, pinch each other and say, look, are you awake? Are you, you know, let me give you some symptoms that you might be asleep. You've stopped coming to church more than once or twice a month or it's so hit or miss, you don't even remember the last time you were here. You stopped giving. Or maybe you just refused to even start giving. You stopped serving. You refused to get in a small group with the excuse, well, I, I, later, you know, I'm too busy right now. You know what my response to that would be? You're too busy. You are way too busy. You're too busy for God. You need to drop some stuff. Maybe you you drown out anything you hear me say that you really don't want to do, like to fast or to go to a prayer meeting. I'm talking Sermon on the Mount, normal Christian life stuff. This is, this is, Jesus called us all to this. So let's be honest. You know, if you pick and choose what you'll obey from what Jesus has clearly laid out in Scripture, then you've adopted a version of cultural Christianity. It's, It's not the real deal. And you'll end up in that first group to drop out, to turn away when the going gets tough. Because you're casual. I mean, it's, it's not real. It, it could be that you were never born again to begin with. I'm not, I'm not being mean here. I'm trying to wake us up. You know, this, is, this concerns me greatly. We're going to talk about this in a couple of weeks. You need to get it settled as to whether, you know, have you really been born again? You need to know that what we have been called into is not some kind of, you know, culture club. We have been called into a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. Christianity is supernatural. It has nothing whatsoever to do with self-help. In fact, Christianity is death to self. (laughs) It's living a resurrected life by the power of Jesus' spirit. It not, has nothing to do with trying to make our lives better. It has to do with dying to a, our lives and living to this new life. I'm telling you, I, there is a radical difference that the Holy Spirit wants to uh, illumine for us. James 4.8 uh, says, uh, th- this is the time to draw near to God. And what will happen? And he'll draw near. Friends, listen to me. That verse is absolutely true. It works every time you act on it. 
It's not some great mystery. It's like, oh, I just felt the presence of the Lord come and leave. No, 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 no. Cause and effect. There's no mystery to it. Sure is the law of gravity. Your heart will melt and get tender and change if you will begin to move toward God. He is not indifferent toward you. You are, the, you are his beloved. You, he loves you with an everlasting love. You move toward him, he will move toward you. Your heart will begin to melt. Your whole life will begin to change. But Jesus said, you've got to move in. When you see, especially when you see these things, you are not in a neutral environment. You've got to press in. You've got to push and say, God, I am going to seek you with my whole heart. I'm going to, I'm going to find you because you're not hiding. You want to be found by me. You're ramping up again, right? Yeah, I am. I just, I'm passionate about this for you. I want you to know this. I want you to possess this. I want this to be real to you. Not just, you know, oh, we go to a church where somebody's teaching on the end times. I want the reality of this to hit us. Man, he's coming. He's coming. He said, everyone, Jesus said, everyone who keeps on asking, keeps on receiving. He who seeks and keeps on seeking, finds. And to him who knocks and keeps on knocking, it'll be open. And because God made us to need one another and function in community, we can't do it alone. Jesus said, by this, the world will know that you're my disciples, the way you treat one another and love one another. You've got to be connected. He doesn't want us barely surviving, hunkered down, barricaded in safe rooms with guns and piles of food. I really believe this is going to be our finest hour. I, you know, we're going to have incredible opportunities to love and lead confused and scared and broken people to Jesus. This will be that time where the power of God will be on the church in unprecedented ways. Here's another reason. We want to study the end times. We want to keep our heads and hearts clear on the fact that God rewards our faithfulness in this. Matthew 20, uh, 16, 27, Jesus is talking about his return when he says, the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they've done. Matthew 25, 21, he gives us an idea of what he's talking about. He said, you are faithful over a few things, I'll make you ruler over many things. Luke 19, 17, he explains, you were faithful in a very little, you will have authority over 10 cities. I mean, this is concrete reality. There's nothing figurative about the, the eternal rewards he's talking about. He, he talked about it a lot. So this must be really important. Matthew 5, 19, he clearly lets us know that our rewards will differ from one another. For, you know, so, and some of us will get more depending on how we've obeyed him. And notice it has nothing to do with our position in life, our skill set, our intellect, even our giftedness. It's all based on our heart response to him. You know, some people think, well, you know, you, you, Ryan, you get to preach to a bunch of people. It has nothing to do with that. It hasn't, it hasn't anything to, doesn't have anything to do with the scope of your ministry or your giftedness. It has to do with your heart connect and your faithfulness to him. Your connection with him. In fact, he said some of us will be called least in the kingdom. Some will be called greatest with most of us somewhere in the middle. But again, nothing to do with our ability. It has to do with our availability. How the way we served him, our heart connection with him. You know, a lot of people that are way up there in the public eye in ministry, they may be messing up big time in terms of what their potential is and what God wants, wants them to do and, and their connection with the Holy Spirit. This is all an internal uh, thing between us and the Lord. I mean, think about this. What you're doing right now will affect what you'll be doing a billion years from now in eternity. Again, that really just gives a whole new meaning to our everyday lives. It's the mundane stuff, the day in the day out stuff, when we feel good, when we feel bad. Every bit of it counts beyond what we can imagine, and it's all being recorded in the book. Revelation 20, uh, 20 verse 12 says so. Talking about faithfulness to show up and serve in grace kids when there are a thousand other things screaming that need to get done. 
You know, we have a couple that come and serve as ushers in the first service and then go over and serve in children's ministry in the second service. I mean, that kind of stuff gets God's attention. Faithfulness on the parking lot, directing traffic in the rain, smiling at people and being hospitable when you're going through a rough patch yourself. This is what faithfulness looks like. Crawls out of bed early, comes directly from work after a long, hard day and keeps the commitment without any fanfare. When, even when it costs something and people don't notice or they're rude to you, Jesus sees all of that stuff. He, he lets us know every bit of it matters. It's going to be rewarded in some surprising ways. This is interesting. The Bible indicates that the glory of God will actually be visible in our resurrected bodies, that they'll differ according to the measure of our obedience. Now, some of us grew up not really liking the way we looked. This is your chance to change it, all right? Here you go, listen to this. Listen to how Paul says this here, 1 Corinthians 15, 41. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory, so also is the resurrection of the dead. Daniel 12, 3. Men and women who have lived wisely will shine brilliantly like the cloudless, star-strewn night skies. He's talking about people who pursue God and let his word transform them to the image of Christ and love people. It says their resurrected bodies and their clothing will reflect his glory. I mean, you want to look really good in eternity? I mean, this is, you, could, you have the potential to be a rock star in the coming kingdom. I mean, come on. Our relationship with Jesus will be so much more satisfying without the pull of sin and all the noise we got going. We'll finally be able to enjoy him without distraction. We'll be learning and worshiping and working and interacting with him far more than we are now. We'll, we'll, be know, we'll know as we're known, the Bible said. Revelation 3.12, Jesus said he'll write his name on us in our mind, in our heart. He'll give us a supernatural understanding of who he is that's so much greater than what we can experience in this life. But from everything else I read that he said, I believe that too is uniquely going to be based on the degree of our heart response to him now. I don't think we're all going to be close to him proximity-wise. I think we'll all be connected by the Holy Spirit, but not all of us are going to serve on his, on his cabinet. Not all of us are going to be involved with him directly. We'll have strategic work assignments that are incredibly fulfilling. They bring us real joy. Can you imagine work without the curse of sin? No frustration, no fatigue, no failure. No more, thank God it's Friday. You know, we're all going to love what we do. I mean, that's that's amazing. Revelation 5.10 says, we've been made kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. All the governments of the earth are going to be replaced in one day. I mean, one day, guys, one day. He's going to, the way, and the way this is going to happen is breathtaking. I mean, so, some of you may end up working at some level in one of those governments, I mean, think of the federal, state, municipal positions that are here in America. In, in addition to the president, there are senators and governors and mayors and heads of agencies and judges and department heads and a legion of support path. Just like today, there will be numerous levels of government, government when Jesus rules. There will be a whole group of people who resist the Antichrist, don't take the mark of the beast, and will be repopulating the earth. And we, with resurrected bodies, will be ruling on the earth in, in many of these positions. God's going to put us in places of authority in his universe to work with him in accomplishing his purposes. I don't think creation's done. I think we're in the seventh day. We're in the day that God rested. But I think it's going to come online again, and our roles will reflect our devotion, the stuff we've done for him in secret. I'm not making that up. Jesus is the one who said that. It's going to get rewarded openly. The Bible says we'll receive praise and honor from God himself. 1 Peter 1.7 says... When your faith remains strong through many trials, it'll bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. When trouble makes life hard, when people misunderstand you, when sickness drags you down, life you just can never seem to get ahead, and life is like one step forward and two steps back. 
but you turn to Jesus and you keep trusting and you keep giving and you keep loving, that stuff moves his heart like nothing else. He remembers it. He sees every single act, every step of devotion, and he's going to display it as a trophy of his grace. In 1 Corinthians 4 or 5, Paul says, the Lord will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, as a kid, I heard more preachers preach on that in the negative, darkest way possible. And I always thought when I read those verses, oh, there it is. God's going to bring all the garbage of our hearts out into the light and say, look at this. (laughs) That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about exposing our brokenness. He's talking about exposing the good things that were in us that nobody knew about, the secret things that we did. He's talking about rewards. He's going to bring it to light. He's going to bring all that good stuff out in the open. That's what his eyes of fire are all about. I was, that, that always freaked me out, too. Oh, he's going to look at me with the eyes of fire and expose all the darkness in my heart. Yeah. He already knows the darkness in my heart. Three times in the book of Revelation, the apostle John describes seeing Jesus with uh, eyes like a flame of fire. You know what that is? He's watching us with a heart, a burning heart of love. They're reflected in his eyes. This is all about the compassion of Jesus. It's not about judgment. He's looking for things in our hearts, in our lives, that he can reward. He's going to be telling stories about our humility and our devotion, stuff nobody knew about, stuff nobody saw. God sees it all. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine having your name come up in a conversation that Jesus is holding? (laughs) Wow. And then there are crowns and precious stones. We're big on this stuff in, you know, and, 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 you know, cro- across all cultures, you know, Olympic athletes have their medals and pro athletes are rings and cups and dishes and green jackets and Oscar, Emmy, Grammy winners get their gold statue and movie music video winners get their golden popcorn and moon man awards, you know, military heroes, their ribbons and purple hearts, politicians, scientists, their Nobel prizes and titles and magazine covers. Those are the world's awards. In the age to come, our rewards will be crowns and precious stones, like the one Jesus mentions in Revelation 2.17. He said, I'll give him a white stone. The Greek word there is shining, glistening. It doesn't necessarily mean white. Glistening stone. And on this stone, a new name engraved, representing our unique relationship with him. You know, in the ancient world, a white stone was often the prize. It was the top prize in their public games. The winner returned to his hometown in a huge parade where he was awarded this white stone with his name inscribed on it, and it was the city's promise to feed, clothe, and house him for the rest of his life. Imagine that. You know, God invites everyone in his kingdom. Again, Matthew 20, 26, Jesus said, whoever desires to become great among you, let him become your servant. He said, aspire to this. You want to do this. You want to be, this is going to, I mean, you're, you're doing stuff in this life to be great. This is going to count forever. This is going to last forever. In, the, in, the, in God's kingdom, the way up is down. That's why we're praying for humility in the fellowship prayers. God, we, help us to follow Jesus' example, to, to, to you know, get low, to, to humble ourselves. We want to increase in love because we want to be great in the eternal kingdom. I want to be great. Don't you? I want to be great, just not in this age. All of us want to be great. Half of you won't admit it. (laughs) Problem is we're trying to do it in the wrong kingdom at the wrong time. We're trying to do it for now. The greatness we want is in that day, in in that era. And we want it... (laughs) We want Jesus to be talking about us. We want Jesus to be telling stories. Oh, you want to get to know that guy? Man, I'm telling you, that dude moved my heart. His faith, his faithfulness. You want to know somebody who's great am I? That's why he's got that white stone. You know, you want to get to know this dude. 
Guys, we, we need to be competing with each other for st- servanthood status. I mean, for being servant of all. The day is coming when the great and mighty one will look at you and he will call your name and every cell in your body will shake. Ben Smith, step forward. Come here. Well done. Good job, man. Good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few days. I'm going to make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Whoa. The crowds of heaven will be applauding. <laughs> I want that. I want that. I want that. And Jesus said, okay, then humble yourself now. Forget what people think about you. Stop, stop looking around to see if everybody thinks you're, goes, yeah. now, stop it. Do stuff for me. But do things in secret. Pour your heart into this. Finally, we study the end times to bolster our confidence in Jesus. Scriptures are just full of references to, uh, to the end time plans of God. The theme running through them all is the certainty of God's victory. The end of the book says God wins, devil loses, you know, period. And God pulls back the curtain for the Old Testament prophet Daniel. More than 500 years before the first Easter, he gets a vision of this incredible scene playing out in heaven right before his eye. Daniel 7, 21 says, I was watching. I'm watching this happen. The Antichrist, the, the ruler, the evil ruler that will come to power in the last days, he was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came. And a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Jesus comes into the courtroom of heaven, having paid for our sins on the cross. He offers his blood on the altar. The devil came in. Father looked at Jesus. He looked at the devil, and he said, Saints win, demons lose. That's my verdict. Jesus is far greater than any king or spiritual power that stands against him. His name is above every name. And at his name, every knee in heaven, on earth, and below the earth will bow in in absolute obedience to Jesus. Now, demons won't like it, but they will bow. And that name has been given now to his church. Jesus is Lord. And it's our knowing that, rewiring our brains to that reality that will keep our hearts at rest regardless of what happens. Giving ourselves to, to, to just feeding our, our hearts and talking to each other about who Jesus is and who we are in him. That's what we've been praying. Lord, who are we to you? Show us. Rewire our brains with this until we're thinking and acting in line with reality. You are, Lord. You did conquer death and hell. You have given us authority in your name. That's maybe the one thing that I just, you know, kind of relearned on this Africa trip. Uh, When I set foot on that first plane from Lambert Airport, I mean, life was suddenly out of my control. I, most of you know, I deal with panic disorder and planes are my nemesis. I, it kind of like stepping into a lion's den. I'm thinking, here we go, Lord, here we go. And I wasn't going to have control for the next four and a half weeks. I mean, I count at least 12 long flights, you know, that we were on before we were done. And, uh, and, and so, you know, that, I had that to go through. That's all happening. And then there are all these times when you know, we're in these situations where I'm called on to minister in, in ways that, you know, I'm totally out of my depth. I, I couldn't even put thoughts together multiple times. I remember standing there in a little jungle village, and we were in this pl- hot, hot, hot room, sweating, and everybody is dancing. And I mean, I'm getting pulled into dancing. I didn't know I could dance like that. And... <laughs> And so, you know, we're doing all this stuff, and, and, and I know I'm about to speak, and not just speak, I'm going to speak through two interpreters, you know, and so, and, and I'm thinking, how's that going to work? And, and, and what am I going to say? I don't, God, I don't know what to say. I don't, I have no idea. What am I doing here? What am I doing in this situation? And it was just, it was, the presence of God was just palpable, it was like the Holy Spirit saying, you're going to open your mouth, and I'm going to fill it. And I thought, okay, we're going to see. 
because nothing I've got written is going to work here, Lord. Nothing. I mean, did, did I make that clear, Lord? Nothing I've got written is going to work in this situation. But you're going to open your mouth, and I'm going to fill it. Uh, and I'm telling you, it happened time after. I, I'd get through talking. I'd look at my kids and my wife and go, did that work? <laughs> They said, oh, my goodness, yeah, that worked. It's like, well, that was a miracle. I have no idea how that made, how that happened. Some days, if I'd known where they were taking us, I would not have gone. <laughs> I would have said, no way. I don't do Africa, especially this part of Africa. I don't do this. So they just didn't tell me where they were taking me. And I went. I mean, it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. But God showed up, and it was like, well, that was exciting. You know, that was, now, I'm not going to tell you I was never anxious, because, you, you know, that'd be a total lie. But I can tell you with no other option, it was real easy to say, Holy Spirit, I'm leaning in. I, 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 there's nothing else. I'm trusting you. There's, there's nothing else, you know. You got to keep us well. You got to keep us malaria free. You got to keep me from stepping on a spitting cobra that they say are all over the place around here. I mean, this is no joke. I grew up in New Orleans. We had snakes, guys. Snakes were like everywhere, and they're nasty. And but there's nothing like Africa for snakes. I mean, they have black mambas. I'm just seeing one that are like. 20 feet long. I mean, these things are ridiculous, and I'm seeing this thing. I'm just seeing it in my head, just slithering out and biting me, and I'm dead, you know. And <laughs> I mean, you need to stay connected. They didn't even start telling us the stories until we were there a few days, you know, because they, they're thinking, they're not even going to stay here if we tell them what could really happen to them. You know, we're asking Nick and Jeff, uh, Nikki and Jeff, you know, uh, so, you know, w what happens if you get bitten by one of these? You know, they take you to the hospital, well, it really wouldn't do any good because they don't have the, they don't have the anti-venom. So what do you do? Well, you pray. <laughs> really? <laughs> there are so many ways to die over there. So many ways to die. My go-to phrase is, you never know Jesus is all you need till Jesus is all you've got. And man, I'm telling you, I was so aware of that every moment. And then we got back, and I got off the plane at Lambert, and I walked into the safety of my house, and I went, Phew, I am glad that is over. I am glad I am back in control. Yeah, what's wrong with that picture? I'm not in control. You're not either. This is an illusion we're living in. We're, we're deceived. We're not in control. You know, the bottom could drop out of my life today. You know, my kids could get uh, uh, some horrible thing happen to them that I can't prevent. I could be diagnosed with a fatal illness. The truth is, my life is not in my hands. Yours isn't either. We're deluded, and the devil likes it that way. That's, that's his big deal in America. It's, oh, everything's nice and control. You're in control. You know, you, nothing bad's going to happen. But that's not true. That's not true. It's not in our control. It's in his hands. And if we'd learn to trust in him, uh, things would start to work out a lot better. A lot more good stuff would happen in our lives. You know, we got to where it was like, well, things aren't working out. God, <laughs> what are you going to do? And it would, it would just be uncanny how things would come together and, and end up working together for our good. God wants us to live in that. Philippians 3, 3, Paul says, we put no confidence in human effort. We put no confidence in self. We don't put any trust in ourselves. I want to learn to trust God like that. With all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. Right here in St. Louis like I did in Mozambique. I want to learn that he really does have the grace to help me in everyday life. 
And I want to challenge you to do the same thing. Let's put some feet to this. Because this is just a pipe dream if we don't do something about this. Because we are deluded. We are asleep to this reality. This week, here's how, here's how we wake ourselves up. This week, ask God to show you something that, you need, that he wants you to do that will totally take you out of your comfort zone. <laughs> Why would I want to do that? Because you want to wake up your heart. You want to you wanna be in the game. You want to know what it's like to have the Holy Spirit moving through you and loving people through you. He wants us to experience what it's like to have God working through us, to have his life. Offer to help somebody with, with something practical this week. Find a small group. I have agoraphobia. That's good. Step into that group with that agoraphobia and say, God, I'm trusting you to help me in this thing. I'm trusting you to work through me. I'm trusting you to be strong in my weakness and get me through this thing. Ask the person you work with who's going through a rough patch if you can pray for him. Yeah, but he might say yes. <laughs> That'll be good. I don't know what I'll pray. That'll be good because you'll open your mouth and the Lord will fill it and it'll shock you as much as it will him. Are you hearing me? If we want God to work through us, guys, I mean, let's face it, we're not gonna, it's not gonna happen in our safe room, you know, with our stock of stuff and with the TV blaring. It's gonna happen when we get out there and say, Lord, you know, get me out of this little bubble that I'm living in. Get me out beyond myself. I'm, I'm yelling at you because I'm yelling at me. I'm sick of living in the safety and security that, that's false, that's not real. I want, I want God like I experienced God. Mozambique, I want that in my heart, in my life. I'm crying out for that. I'm crying out for that for all of us. Lord, we want to experience you. Start serving somewhere here in the church. I mean, these are simple things. We, we have areas of need in this church that should not be in a church that's our baptism ministry. We need a lot of volunteers there. We need a bunch of volunteers in Grace Kids. Here's your chance to be great in the kingdom of God. Serve one of the little ones. Jesus said, I noticed that stuff. Get involved in student ministry. We got students who are cutting themselves. They're in so much pain right now. Get in there. And say, I don't know what to say. You don't need to. You've got God living in you. Get in there. Ask God to use you. Be a Stephen minister. Well, I don't know how to be a Stephen minister. Neither did any of our Stephen ministers. They just jumped in there. Do you know that our Stephen ministry has an opportunity to reach out to a, a lot of these guys that are getting back from the war right now, a war veterans, and we don't have the people to put in, in those positions? I mean, here's your chance to get in the game. Visit our serving expo out here. After the service, sign up for something. Sign up for something before you leave here. And if you gotta leave quick, grab a card from the back of your chair and just say, you know, count me in, put your name and contact info on it. Th th drop it in the offering box before you leave. Right now, start stepping out in areas where you need to trust them. Those places where you, you're scared, where you feel inadequate, this is how you'll start to encounter God. This is how you start to break free from fear. You get on a plane when everything in you goes, I'm gonna die. You go, God, I'm going to trust you. I will live and not die. I'm going to believe that you're bigger than this. I'm, I'm going to believe that you can conquer these things in my heart with my heart trembling. I'm going to act in faith with fear going through my body. Yeah? We want to have confidence that God's in charge. This is how we get it. That he really will direct us and use us and strengthen us and be everything we need. This is how we get it. This is how we get there.